Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another year of Garden Hour. Uh, for those of you that joined us last year, we're looking forward to another season of trying to give you timely information. As you can see from our schedule, we're going to be on every week and go over things that are really occurring at that time or giving you a heads up as to what you should be doing in the following week. Um, and uh, we're going to go through the entire growing season. Uh, this is a takeoff or a spinoff, if you will, for the old TV show Garden Line, for those that may remember it. That was a show that was during the 90s and uh, 2000s, in which uh, in an evening on public TV, we would sit around a table and answer your questions for about an hour. So this is kind of similar, but the difference is each one of us is going to spend a little time talking about something that's really important for this week. And we're also going to answer your questions on that topic as well as any other. So what we're going to do is to start out with each one of us is going to go over a little bit of something going on this week. And please feel free to ask questions during that time period. We do have the chat feature in there for questions. And uh, we'll answer the questions as they come in. And then towards the end, we'll just kind of have a general discussion as well as answer your questions. And we'll wrap it up here by the end of the hour. So to start out with, my name is John Ball, and I'm the uh, professor of forestry and the extension forestry special here at South Dakota State University, and I've been doing that for about 30 years now. And I'm also the forest health special for the South Dakota Department of Ag and Natural Resources. And as you might expect tonight, I'm going to be talking about some things that have to do with trees. But I'm joined this evening by one of our other panelists. Uh, Rhoda. So Rhoda, tell them a little about yourself and what you're going to talk about. Good evening, everyone. I'm a horticulture specialist dealing mostly with fruits and vegetables. And so tonight I'm going to be talking about radishes, one of those early season vegetables and, and a great one for kids uh, to get a, a quick crop back. Uh, you might even be able to plant them now and have some radishes by the time school's out. So uh, and next we have uh, Christine Lang. Christine. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us again this year. I'm Christine Lang, Assistant Professor and SDSU Extension Consumer Horticulture Specialist based here in Brookings. Um, this is going to be my second season in the state of South Dakota, so I look forward to continuing to help you with your flowering plant problems, anything that's a bedding plant or a perennial, as well as house plants. And I work on vegetables a little bit as well in collaboration with Rhoda Burrows. And today, I think the theme is going to be patience for the evening. So with that in mind, Amanda, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Amanda Bachman. I am the Pesticide Education and Urban Entomology Field Specialist for SDSU Extension. I've been in Pier now for nine years. So this will be my ninth growing season in South Dakota, second year on Garden Hour. And I'll be giving a little bit of an update on what arthropods you might be seeing moving around out there. And we definitely welcome your questions in either the chat or the Q&A. And we do have some links that we'll share where if you have a picture of a plant issue or an insect that you'd like to ask us about, um, we've got some ways for you to submit those as well. And we can field them perhaps after uh, the main portion of tonight's event. So I will turn it back to Dr. Ball to go through his slides. All right. Well, thanks. And yeah, I like the idea of some pictures. That would be helpful. Uh, make sure they're in focus and we only need one and no videos. Uh, you know, if you're showing us a plant, you don't need to walk around it. We'll see it. So anyway, let's go on to my slides here. I can get the sharing done right here. And come on, slides. There we go. So I'm going to start out with, with where we're at, and I'll do that uh, each week of the show. But I want to start out with growing degree days, base 50. And that's something that horticulturists and entomologists use frequently because plant development and insect development is really driven by temperature. Uh, if we have a nice warm spring, things develop sooner. Uh, I can remember crab apples in full bloom now. In fact, bloom's already fading. 
And this year they haven't even started to flower because it's just been too cool. And I'll give you kind of our three main areas in the state. We are behind from last year, even in the hills now, but Aberdeen, oh my goodness, uh, they are in the frozen tundra. They're at 40. Uh, the northern end of our state this year, uh, the glaciers must be starting to cover it because they have just not moved very quickly at all uh, in temperature. Sioux Falls is behind. We were at about 200 last year at this time. Um, the little crab apple you see there in Brookings, uh, buds are just barely forming where we've had it past bloom in many years, or certainly by Mother's Day, we've had things in full bloom. Rapid City was actually doing fairly well, but they've had a cold snap too. And so we're a little behind in temperature and we're behind in moisture though. It's been spotty and we've had some rains and some snows throughout the state. Uh, but uh, some people mentioned, uh, and I like the term Christine mentioned, patience because everything's going to be a little slower and maybe that's good if you like radishes because you still have time for those but let me talk about emerald ash borer and i just John, came yes gonna, somebody was asking what the base base 50 is oh um the base 50 is what we take in fact i'll show you a chart next week but base 50 is taking a look at the highs and the lows for the days and looking at temperatures over 50 degrees that's that's our threshold but you know what i'll explain that a little bit more detail next week because we are going to talk about it every week so thank you for the question thank you rhoda um this what you're looking at is emerald ash borer and i just came from our emerald ash borer workshop in sioux falls uh, we were outside this today going out and going over injections and such. Uh, great field day and it was actually warm enough we could stand outside and not freeze. The emerald ash borer right now is in a little cell actually in the wood. So if you just pull the bark off you won't even know they're there. You really have to scrape away to find them. And uh, they're just kind of out of that little curled stage what we call the J stage and starting to form their pre-pupa, which then goes into a pupil, the rusting stage. So they're kind of shrinking and we are getting a few, just a few that look like this. And you can see that that almost looks like an adult, but that's still going to take several weeks to develop. Um, so right now I'm figuring that the emergence of the adults, which will be coming out of these chambers, and there's several that I caught last year, is going to be about first week of June. Uh, because the adults merge at about 500 to 550 growing degree days. And that, and it's about the same time that black locust blooms. And, and the importance of all this is once the trees start putting their leaves out, which I hope is going to occur here in the next week or two, it's the beginning of the injection season. And what we want to see is in the counties to which we find emerald ash borer, and right now it's limited to two counties in South Dakota, uh, Lincoln and Minnehaha County. But if you have an ash tree and you live in those, those counties, particularly if you live in one of the communities such as Canton, Sioux Falls, if you have an ash tree alike, you should have it treated started this year. And the best treatment window is between leaf out, which should happen about another week, and about the time the adults start to fly, which will be early June. And the reason for that is we get the chemical in at that time of year, it'll be in the leaves and mom needs to feed on the leaves for about a week or so before she lays eggs. And if we can kill mom before she lays eggs, that's even better. And if a couple eggs are still laid, uh, it'll kill the larvae while they're very small. Now, again, if you live outside of those two counties, there's no need to treat. I'm figuring we're going to find it in a few more communities and probably a few more counties uh, during this growing season. It seems we find them in May, so stay tuned. But in those two counties, certainly now is the time to begin thinking about treating. For the rest of you, you might want to start thinking about planting because in our inventories that we're doing across South Dakota, with the help of master gardeners, I might add, We've been going through and taking a look at what are the tree populations in towns. And the depressing fact is most of our communities 
have way too many ash trees. In fact, maybe a quarter to a third of all the trees in their town are ash, which means once emerald ash borer arrives in their community, you're going to start losing those trees. You will most likely lose them all, except for the ones that are being treated, within about 10 years. Now, the city of Sioux Falls, city of Brookings, city of Yankton, and a number of other communities are being very proactive and are starting to remove ash trees in anticipation of attack, or in Sioux Falls, removing trees that are already being attacked. In other words, let's reduce the numbers and plant something else. But what to plant? Well, I'll tell you, we're kind of like lemmings. We just run to the next shiny light. When uh, we had streets filled with elms, when the elms started dying of Dutch elm disease, we all ran and planted ash trees. Now that everybody knows, don't plant ash and start removing ash. And this is a street that was all ash in Sioux Falls. What's everybody planting? They're planting maple. And in fact, some of our communities, almost a third of their trees are already maples. And while we do have a few exotic threats, Asian longhorn beetle, for example, it's not found in our state yet. I worry about ones we don't even know about yet that may come in. So what I'm asking people to do is when you're looking at planting the spring, you might want to slow down or stop planting maples. They're wonderful trees. In fact, I'm going to talk to you about one. But we have way too many of them. And 30 years from now, someone's going to be talking to you about why did we plant all these maple trees? Because now we have this new insect or new disease. So I'm going to spend just a moment going over a couple trees you might want to be thinking about. And I know I'm going to start with a maple tree. It's only one. Uh, this is called the State Street Maple. And the reason I'm okay with this, it's native to Asia. And most of our exotic threats are actually coming from that continent. So I'm not too worried about planting it, but I, I don't want to see it over planted. But State Street Maple is a nice small tree. It gets about 30 feet tall, barely needs pruning, has kind of a pumpkin yellow fall color and seems very well adapted to our soils, alkaline, and a little bit on the dry side too. I see very little problem with leaf scorch on them during our hot summer. So if you say, well, can I plant a maple? Okay, here's one, but please, 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 we need to kind of stop planting the autumn blaze maples that are way over planted, and those will be susceptible to any exotic threat. One that North Dakota came up with, which is a nice tree, is the Prairie Horizon Alder. If you're looking for a small tree, you know, maybe 25 feet tall, uh, this is a nice little tree. It takes wet soils and dry soils. We don't plant a lot of alders in our community, so this is one we can probably fit in a few more without any problem. No fall color to it, and I, and I know that'll be disappointing to some people, but in the fall of the year, it does produce these little strobis. And in the winter, they open up, turn black. They look like little pine cones. And as kids, we used to go out and collect those, spray paint them silver, and make little Christmas decorations out of them. So, okay, you don't have a fall color, but you do have some pretty nice winter interest. And I'll tell you, this tree I really, really love. It's the heritage oak. I know people say, I don't want to plant an oak it grows too slow. And I won't tell you this is a very fast grower, but I will tell you it's a reasonably fast grower. Um, so if you want an oak and you want an oak that can take our soils, our climates, tough as nails, but looks very refined, uh, the heritage oak. Now it's a cross between the English oak and our bur oak. And we'll take alkaline soils, it'll take dry soils. Now admittedly on dry soils, you might wanna water them. But you can get a foot and a half a year out of them. And, and that's not a bad growth rate. Uh, very few problems with leaf tatters. The foliage is just a nice glossy green, doesn't have mildew problems. I think it's one of the best trees that have been developed. And we don't have a lot of oaks in our communities, mainly because people say, well, they grow too slow. And it's an undeserved reputation, but yes, oaks are never growing as fast as maples. But I will tell you, this one's pretty close. Now, the other thing I want to mention is we've really planted too many spruce as well. And we need to go on a little bit of a spruce diet. 
Um, I could spend every week talking about the problems I've seen on blue spruce. And there's a lot of different blue spruce. You know, the Colorado spruce that you see that looks like most of them, the Coster blue spruce, that's just gorgeous. And if you want something that's going to be a showstopper, uh, that columnar blue spruce, also known as Skyrocket, you can probably see why it's called that. It looks like somebody launched it. And that's a 40-year one, by the way. Uh, but we've planted way too many blue spruce in particular. And they look nice for about 20 years. And then they start having problems. And usually I'll get a call and someone will say, well, my, my spruce doesn't look very good. And I know what they're going to say next. It's about 20, 25 feet tall. Or they're going to say it's about 20, 25 years old. And what can I do? Not a lot. It's dying. That's what they do. Um, so we might want to look at some other plants. And if you say, John, I really have to plant a spruce. The Meyer spruce is just gorgeous. Now, I took that picture of uh, ones being grown up by Gettysburg, and they're really a tough tree, will take our climate very well. They grow slower than blue spruce. I'm going to tell you that, because otherwise you're going to be disappointed. Um, blue spruce will put on a foot a year. These will put on nine inches a year, for example. Um, they're great. They have soft needles, not like a blue spruce. When you touch them, they don't, they're not prickly. But I will say the needles are soft enough that if uh, deer are really hungry, they'll nibble on them. And I've seen some that have stayed three feet forever just because the deer just browse them every year. So it might be best an in-town than a, a windbreak tree. And one we're trying to get more people to consider is subalpine fir. Um, that's a mature one over at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, but there's drop dead gorgeous ones up in uh, Jamestown, North Dakota, for example. It's native to Montana. You can find them growing wild out by buildings and that. Uh, so it's a fairly tough plant, has that nice blue coloration, and it's only going to get about 25 feet tall. And for most locations, that's all you need. So if you say, well, I have to have something that's blue or blueish, well, Go on a spruce diet, consider this. Oh, and then my last one, and this is a hard sell. Uh, if you really want a tough conifer, Siberian larch. Uh, it's our only zone one tree. It'll tolerate minus 60 air temperatures in the winter without a problem. Uh, it'll take our alkaline soils. It'll actually take dry soils fairly well too. So it sounds like a wonderful tree. Oh, and the fall color on this is a drop dead gorgeous yellow. I love it. But why don't people plant it? Well, they don't plant it because notice I didn't call it an evergreen. I called it a conifer. And the reason for that is this tree drops its needles every fall. And I'll admit, during the winter, it looks like a dead spruce. But come spring, that light green foliage comes out sometime in May here. And it's just gorgeous all summer long. And then in the fall, the foliage turns a brilliant yellow and then drops usually in October. So, OK, you'll have to accept the fact that it's not going to have any needles on it in the fall and the winter. And you're going to have to explain to your neighbors, at least first year, you know it's supposed to do that. But uh, I like this tree. It's a tough tree. If you're a snowbird, it's a perfect tree because you don't see it during the winter anyway. But you know what? We plant deciduous trees and they drop all their leaves in the fall. So you might want to consider this one as well. Well, I've taken up enough time on this. So I'm going to turn this now over to Rhoda and she can chat a little bit about her stuff. So Rhoda, take it away. I'll stop you just a minute, John. And there was in the chat wondering how tall heritage oaks get. Okay. Um, first of all, unless you're a very young person, you're never going to see it. All right. Because it will take a while. But, you know, plan on, on the east end of the state, 60 or 70 feet. On the, uh, let's say the western end of the state, probably 40 feet because you'll have a slower growth rate. So it is a big tree, very similar to our bur oak. So plan accordingly, and I do like that question, is try to make sure we have adequate space for the tree. Though again, figure about 18 inches a year. So it's going to take a while to get there. There's also a question on suggestions for high wind trees 
from New Underwood. Oh, yeah, New Underwood. <laughs> That's in like 70 mile per hour. Yeah, oh, man. Okay, now I hate to sound like a broken record, but uh, the uh, Heritage Oak does have resistance from leaf tatter. And so it'll take high winds and without the leaves being all torn up. So I'd still go with that, though, again, except the fact in New Underwood, you're looking at probably a foot a year, though. I've actually had some people plant them out by uh, Long Valley that they're watering them and they're getting 18 inches a year. So it's really the water is the big issue more than anything else. The other one is the uh, uh, the elm and in fact, uh, Princeton elm which is a, um, an American elm, but very tolerant of Dutch elm disease, that would be another good choice for a new underwood. It'll take your climate in that too. And then I'm going to mention a maple, uh, but it's another maple and it's Asian. So I'm not worried about the disease issues or insect issues. And it's called the three flower maple, three flower maple. And it's not a big tree. It's going to be about 20 feet tall but the bark is gorgeous. It's peeling, kind of a cinnamon uh, brown. Um, you'll love that tree. And it's really noted for the fact that it doesn't have leaf tatters. So those are good choices. And next week, I'm going to give a few more for all our West River folks that don't get to play with a full box of crayons because uh, your climate is really better for prairie than for, for trees. But those are a couple suggestions for today. Thanks. So we are now going to talk about something much smaller, radishes. <laughs> yeah, in, in looking up some information about radishes, I came across uh, the medicinal uses, which I had never uh, investigated before. Traditionally, it was used for gallstones, for indigestion, liver, and Mostly gastric issues, it seems like. It seems like any, any vegetable that has a very strong flavor is good for something besides uh, puckering up your mouth. But, but uh, uh, research has, has uh, verified some of these traditional uses, showing protection against gallstones, colon and prostate cancer. Um, may help lower cholesterol and, and may help regulate insulin for diabetes. So uh, I'm, I'm not a big radish eater, but then I read all these things and thought, well, maybe I should add a few more to my diet. It turns out that radish sprouts or microgreens, so, so when you plant the seeds, what comes up before you get the bulb is actually particularly good for you. So uh, consider adding that to your to your diet. Oops, my fingers uh, not very controllable today apparently. So every year we get the question of I planted radishes why didn't why didn't they bulb up I'm, I'm getting just those leaves which now we know are good to eat anyway but probably a little smaller than what's shown here. So I've, I've included a picture here of, you can see real tiny radish roots there. This is an indication of being planted way too close together. So that, that's what will happen if you don't thin them. Um, sometimes you can get the tape where the seed is spread out for you. Uh, but if you spread them too thick, because it's real tiny seed, uh, you can end up with this. So you need to thin them afterwards as soon as they start coming up. So that's one uh, reason for no bulbs. The other is if you plant them too late in the year, uh, temperatures over 80 degrees discourage bulbing. Uh, you'll also get too hot in terms of taste uh, during, the, during the hotter season. So you get the, the more mild and, and best bulbing when the radish is growing very quickly, uh, which means it has enough nitrogen and enough water. And if it's uh, lacking either of those, it will grow more slowly and you'll not get as nice of a bulb either. And then I 
threw in one that came across on our uh, Great Lakes Extension uh, listserv. And this was in an organic farm and they were wondering, what is chewing on these radishes? Uh, just kind of scraping the surface a little bit. And they, you can think about what, what might be going on here. And uh, the, after tossing it back and forth, the consensus was that it is probably slugs. So you have it nice and, and moist. And if you have a lot of uh, mulch around your garden, you may have some slugs hiding under there. And, and uh, they can make sort of an unsightly uh, radish. It's still fine to eat, but, but uh, just don't think about the slugs that, <laughs> that chewed on it first. And that's what I'm talking about today. And I will turn it over to Christine. All right. Hello again, everybody. If you have any vegetable questions, please um, please type those in the chat and we can circle back to those with Rhoda after I've shared my slide set as well. All right, so it's the time of year where um, some of you might have similar situations in your homes right now, or if you have a small greenhouse in your backyard or a set up in your garage. Um, if you're like me, you're trying to maybe grow seedlings wherever you can. So these are both photos that I've taken. The photo on the left is pepper transplants that are growing in the greenhouse where I get to have nice ideal conditions for my work. And the photo on the right is my home bathroom. Um, I have other better spots in terms of light to grow transplants, but I also have curious pets that wanna help me garden. So we rigged up a couple of shelves and we bought some LED strip lights. And I, I share this photo to just let you know, sometimes folks are wondering, oh, do I have to have the, the primo seed starting setup? You know what, with some totes and some pots, and a little bit of light and a fan, you can too um, start transplants. Now, if you're really interested in starting annual flower seeds, the window for doing that successfully has probably passed. A lot of our, um, a lot of the annual flowers, you're looking at eight to 12 weeks from germination until they're at a size that's nice for transplanting. So shameless plug to visit your local garden center for some transplants. Um, Cool season veggies, um, again, we're, we're not quite there in terms of putting them outside necessarily. Um, you know, your lettuces, your cabbages, they're probably gonna be okay transplanted outside as we look to warm up for the rest of this week. But again, um, those transplants, it's probably a little late to get those started. Something you could still start, and I would recommend, um, in fact, I'm gonna be starting my transplants in a couple of weeks, is your squash, your pumpkins, your melons. They only need three to four weeks to be grown as transplants. And um, starting them too early just results in really large plants that are root bound that might have issues with transplant shock. So um, that's an example of something that if you haven't started it yet, you still could. You might be looking at the photo on the left and going, man, you started those peppers on April 5th and this photo was taken today. Um, so if you don't have bottom heat for your seedlings, like a heat mat, um, germination can be slow. It's not impossible necessarily. And again, this is a large greenhouse bench. I don't have enough bottom heat for all of these plants. So I seeded those on April 5th. We got them watered in. Again, these were nice greenhouse conditions, but it still took over a week for those peppers to germinate. So the plants are still quite small. Um, but a common mistake I see in seedling production for flowers and vegetables in a home setting is folks get really excited and start those plants way too early and then they're crowded and leggy and what on earth do you do? So if you're looking over your shoulder right now at some of your plants or listening on your phone and walking around and going, oh no, what do I do? Um, 
if those plants are crammed together and the pots can be spread out so everything has room to grow, that's a quick, easy solution. If things are starting to look yellow and stretched and the term we use is leggy, um, can, you, can you adjust the light? Can you get that in a south facing window so it's getting full sun conditions or can you get some more supplemental light or lower those lights closer to those plants? So again, they're not reaching for light. Have you fertilized your transplants recently? Um, if you're starting to notice discoloration, um, you know, pale greens or a lot of purpling, it might be time to um, use a water soluble fertilizer. And again, follow the label instructions when you do that. And another thing to do with seedlings, especially to prepare them for our South Dakota conditions, looking at the last month of our windy conditions, is if um, you can get a fan on those transplants. Again, that just helps with stem strength and can help control height a little bit. And it's one more step to prepare you for, um, for putting those plants outdoors. And we'll be talking about hardening off in a, a future episode, but just know, keep those seedlings where they are for right now um, and keep them warm and safe. Um, preparing planting beds. Again, I know we're all anxious to get outside and work in the garden. Um, as, as the temperatures start to warm up, maybe wait until this weekend so some more insects have a chance to leave the stalks and leaf litter left behind by your perennial plants. Um, but it's gonna be a beautiful weekend, at least um, in the Eastern part of the state. So that's a great opportunity to get rid of those stalks, rake away leaves from plants, see if you need to top dress any mulch in your perennial gardens. Um, the best way to beat weeds is to prevent them from coming up through that mulch. So if you've had thin spots or a lot of weed issues last year, pulling and removing those weeds and then top dressing with mulch now would be a great option. If you're working in raised beds, one thing to evaluate is how you can add to that soil mix. Can you add a couple of inches of compost? I'm going to be, these are pictures of my own raised beds. I'm going to be adding some compost as well as some peat. Um, that, that you can buy those compressed bales and top dressing with that and mixing it into the soil because I found that my water holding capacity of these beds, they dried out really quickly. Plus by adding compost, you're adding, um, adding nutrients back into those raised beds where you don't have a base of mineral soil to draw on. Some other options for fertility in raised beds is you could look at using a slow release granular fertilizer and there are synthetic and organic options. And again, those products should have a label recommendation for you know one tablespoon for so many cubic feet of soil and you could calculate. But again, you're gonna to wanna to mix that completely into the soil. And then as you water, that's going to dissolve and break down throughout the season. So some things to think about for preparing your planting beds. And last but not least, I've already alluded to this, but it's not quite safe to have those plants outside, um, especially some of our more cold sensitive plants, such as our, our zinnias, our sunflowers, a lot of our beautiful flowering bedding plants, just it's still way too cold. Our sweet potato vines would be very, very unhappy. Um, I was commiserating with a master gardener last night. We were swapping photos. So the photo on the left is her, her plant shopping trip and everything staying indoors. And the photo on the right was me bringing my plants in and they're under plastic domes again to keep the curious pets at bay. Um, so if you've got, if you've already gone to the garden center or are looking forward to doing so this next weekend, keep an eye on temperatures especially many of our annuals, if you get below 50 degree night temperatures, you're going to see damage. I know it's really tempting to hang on to those plants in the garage for days on end, but know that without lights, you're, you're going to start to see issues with your plants. So if you can hold them indoors near a sunny window, or if you have a space where you already have grow lights in place, or if you can just hold off um, on another for another week for that shopping trip. And again, we do want you to go on those plant shopping trips because that's the best part of spring, but just keep an eye on the long-term weather forecast. And there are some cool season options. Um, pansies, sweet alyssum, lobelia. One of my favorites is osteospermum. It has a beautiful daisy flower and it does really well in cool conditions. And I've got a reference at the bottom of the page, but there's an article with some ideas if you're like, I need to get plants out. Um, those would be some good options to start with. And um, as always, we would love for you guys to stay in touch with us and um, subscribe to our newsletter. So a lot of the articles I've referenced today, we, 
are distributed in our biweekly garden newsletter. And we will put that link in the chat as well for you to subscribe to that. And last but not least, this is a plug for Garden Discovery Festival. It's going to be held at McCrory Gardens. Myself and Dr. John Ball, as, one of, as well as one of our wonderful master gardeners, is we're all going to be presenting. There will be a plant sale. There will be educational booths. Amanda Bachman's going to be there with insects for show and tell and ID. Um, and we have several nonprofit partners and folks from the NRCS are going to be there talking about soil health for gardens. So it's going to be a really great day. And one benefit of the slow spring is that um, I think we're going to be at peak tulip bloom for tulip time. You know, this time last year, tulips would have already been peaking, but come out for Garden Discovery Festival, enjoy the tulips, explore the gardens, see the spring blooms, and we would love to visit with you. All right. I see some questions rolling in about several things. Um, I have to plant in containers due to deer and rabbits, how to get a decent yield. And I'm using fabric containers in Rapid City. Um, my advice there is again, paying attention to your soil mix, making sure that you have compost included so that you have some form of fertility, making sure you have good water holding capacity. And that's where the compost and the peat um, work really well together. Um, in raised beds, especially if you have a large volume raised bed, it's totally okay to incorporate some mineral soil in there, but pay attention to where that soil was grabbed from. Was it dug out of a field? Um, you know, sometimes we like to borrow mineral soil from our agronomic fields and you might have herbicide residues that create issues, or I've seen instances where folks have pulled um, soil or compost from a pile in their yard and then they had lots of weird funky growth and they went, oh no, my husband sprayed the, sprayed the weeds on that pile earlier in the season. Um, other thoughts on that one, Rhoda, for high yield in containers? Oh, a couple, a couple, little bit further down, uh, let's just clarify, she was asking about potatoes in particular. Okay. And that I would, I would underscore what Christine said with the containers. Sometimes we don't think about how much more nutrients are required to be added uh, to an artificial soil versus our native soils. Uh, I tell people we rarely need to add potassium to our soils, but if you're growing in a container, then you may need more potassium and potatoes in general are pretty heavy feeders. So uh, once, once you've got, uh, once they're up and starting to bloom, then's a good time to add some more nitrogen. Uh, the other thing that can happen with containers with potatoes is they don't really like to have hot roots. And so if you've got a black fabric, you might wanna shade that in some way. Uh, so that you keep the soil a little bit cooler. Excellent. And Rhoda, I see we have a couple more vegetable questions, so I'm going to just turn those over to you. All right. Uh, we have a question about my rhubarb isn't as large as my neighbor's. Rhubarb envy, I guess. What can I do to get it to grow bigger? Um, it may be a case of variety, in which case you're kind of stuck, but it very likely has to do with nutrients and perhaps watering. Um, and so we often recommend putting on compost or manure in the fall uh, when you're done picking. And so give it a, a good dose of, of nutrients to come up in the spring, you know, those big leaves use up a lot of, of nutrients. So, um, so it may be fertility, it may be water, uh, it may be that you're picking more than your neighbor is, and so it runs down the crown reserves a little bit more. And so those are several possibilities to, to look at. What is the best mulch to use in my asparagus bed after I get cleaned up and weeded? I'd like to have, it will depend a little bit where you are in the state. Uh, 
for example, if we were just talking about up in the northeast part of the state where you've got soggy soils, uh, we want to be pretty careful with mulch and uh, asparagus is asparagus does have a little bit of a tendency to get a rot. And so you'll want to be careful about that. So if you're up in that area where your soils are staying pretty moist, I would opt for a light kind of mulch that, that doesn't retain a lot of water. Uh, if you're out here in Rapid City, you can go with a heavier mulch. Uh, straw is pretty good mulch for for most things in that it uh, stays a little lighter and doesn't form a real thick, uh, uh, it allows for some aeration is what I'm trying to say. So those, those might be some options. Uh, I wouldn't go for something like a, a wood chips or something like that because they might scrape the, the spears a little bit when they're coming up. Southwest outside of hot springs, okay. So straw, if you're using lawn clippings, I would go no more than about a half inch, keep it pretty thin. And again, as Christine mentioned, make sure that your lawn clippings have not been, that your lawn has not been sprayed with herbicide. Uh, although asparagus can take quite a bit, but but uh, it will eventually wear it down. Rhoda, I see we had a question about wildflowers pop in. So I'm, I'd like okay. to address that one. Um, so the question is, is it too late to plant a packet of wildflowers? If you were planning on starting those as seedlings and growing them out and transplanting them as individual plants, I'd say it's getting to be a little late. If you're planning on just tilling up or scratching up an area of the garden, um, you're right on track. In fact, I would, you know, if we're looking at a general soil recommendation for wildflowers, again, soils are still very cool. I looked up in Brookings, I think they're about 45 degrees right now. I would wait at least another week until soil temperatures are 50 or even 60 degrees, because what that means is um, whatever patch of the garden you've worked, if you've tilled it up or controlled the weeds, if you put those wildflowers out, gently rake them into the soil, you want them to germinate quickly so that you, you know, have all of those flowers and you don't have a bunch of other weeds competing, competing with that wildflower mix. And I have a hunch that it's going to be gorgeous. So I would wait at least another week. Um, again, make sure it's a patch of patch of ground that's been worked or raked up and isn't all just full of weeds or you're not just dumping in, into your grass because the grass will win. <laughs> And it looks like we have an apple question as well. So Rhoda and John, I'm gonna turn that back over to you. All right, what is the best way to get a good yield with my mature apple trees in Pier? Uh, there's, there's a couple things that we are gonna be looking at with apples. Uh, one again, uh, probably the, the thing that we need to look at first is does the whole tree get good light? If it's, I've seen the apple trees that, that you couldn't even see anything behind it uh, before the leaves were on the tree. And if that's the case, then it needs to be thinned out so you get li good light penetration. If you don't get light to the middle of the tree, uh, flower buds will not form. So that, that's one possibility if you're, if you're not getting very many apples. Uh, we can have problems with a nutrient imbalance. So if you're fertilizing your lawn very heavily and your apples are in the middle of the lawn, they may actually be getting too much nitrogen and that can discourage uh, fruit set and bud formation also. Uh, the third thing that can happen with many of our apples is that they go into alternate year bearing. And so you have a heavy crop one year and not the next. Or sometimes if it gets frosted, you don't get any apples that year. The following year, you get a real heavy crop. It depletes the tree at the same time that it's trying to form buds for next year. And so you don't get many buds for the return 
trip. Uh, and uh, I'll let John jump in if he'd like. Yeah, sure. And Rhoda, I think the, the biggest thing you'd already mentioned, that's light. Uh, when they say mature apple trees, you know, what height are these? You know, if it's a semi dwarf, I'm not as much concerned as you, but as you well know, we get lots of people that have 25 foot apple trees and it's really hard to get any fruit in the interior of those. Uh, so good pruning is, and training, really training them so you have an open canopy is important to really maximize fruit production. So, I mean, uh, light management is really the name of the game. And, and I see we have a question here on uh, uh, cedar apple rust and apple scab. Um, I'll start out with that. Uh, first of all, I want to put in a reminder, be cautious using the general fruit tree sprays. And the reason for that is uh, they've got an insecticide in it. They usually have a couple of fungicides in it. And they'll say spray every week. Well, you're spraying during full bloom with Carbaryl 7, and you're going to kill a lot of bees. And so I suggest you stay away from the general fruit tree sprays. Uh, they're really not the best and target them more. Um, the other thing, too, to re remember is the time to treat for apple scab is really now as those buds are just starting to open cedar apple rust we can wait a little bit we're not getting the uh, the, the uh, spores developing on the cedars yet and the other problem is there's a lot of chemicals that are good for apple scab but are not effective against rust and um, in, in fact i think wrote off the top of my head captan is for apple scab but it doesn't work against the rust disease if i recall properly um mm -hmm. Can you think of a fungicide for a homeowner that would work for both? Um, <laughs> the, the name of the chemical just went right out, oh. but Immunox. Immunox, that's it. Yep, that would work. <laughs> All right, now we're thinking. And that you'd spray about every 10 days or so, starting about now here in Brookings, we're just starting to get the buds opening. And you would end up spraying all the way through, um, usually until the weather starts to dry in May, if I have it correctly. So end of May. Um, so you are going to be spraying during that entire time period. Um, I don't see a lot of problem with rust, though, do you? I see most of it with apple scab. I have up in the northeast part of the state a little bit more than anywhere. I would say Watertown and Aberdeen. If is where I've seen rust if I've seen it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's, uh, so if you if you are having your apple tree suffer from both, and I'm assuming it's affecting the fruit, not just the foliage, which, which can be a problem. Uh, first of all, you're gonna be spraying a lot, uh, but here's one thing you can do right now, and that's go out and mow your lawn. Uh, any fallen leaves, you want them shredded into nothing right now if you can. Is it gonna be, help a lot? No, but it'll help a little. When I worked, worked in orchards in Michigan back in the 80s, we mowed those things tight, but we were growing them by the section. So that made sense. If you mow your lawn and your neighbor doesn't and they have apple trees, it's virtually no control. But uh, keeping things clean is a real help. And you're going to be one of the few people that hopes we don't have rain this spring because the dry season means we don't have the problem. And the last thing I'll mention on it, is the first couple of sprays are the most critical. If you say, well, I don't have time to spray for the next couple of weeks and the leaves are already out, in my opinion, it's probably not even worth spraying. You really got to start now as the buds are expanding. We had a, a comment on the uh, fruiting question that uh, the, they do get every other year good production. So a way around that, if you, which you may not want to do if it's a very tall tree, uh, is to do thinning. And you have to do it within about four to six weeks post bloom. And that's 
thin down, you know, when you've got a cluster of three apples, take two of them off, just leave one, leave them about, you know, a hand width or spread hand width apart. Uh, and that will help the tree to have enough uh, energy for next year. And it'll give you bigger apples as well. So that's one, one option if you've got lots of time and don't mind climbing up into your tree if your tree is tall. <laughs> Yeah, and, and yeah, and don't climb them. Uh, but yeah, it's it's the uh, hand thinning the fruit will work if you can get it into regular bearing. That would probably be the best. Um, you know, the other one I see more insect problems than anything else. Apple maggot is what I see the most of. Though I do see coddling moth as well. Um, so those are those are some pests that we often see, and I I think I end up seeing more treatments for those than I do for fungal yeah. diseases with apples. So yeah, right. particularly West River will have yeah. apple mag or cuddling moth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, Amanda, any more insects you'd like to chat about as we're running down on time? <laughs> yeah, I will uh, share my two slides here. Yep, go into quick. it. I think you got a spider, right? I do. I do All have right. a spider. A scary spider, people. Oh my it's, gosh. <laughs> it's teeny tiny. Uh, <laughs> so I am, uh, I really enjoy spiders. Try to get more people to think that they're cool and let them live. This is a cute little jumping spider. I've noticed that they're starting to be a lot more active around my house. I noticed them by my garage door, by the back door to my house. And this one caught some sort of teeny tiny little fly uh, for lunch. So the arthropods out there, especially the ones that have overwintered as adults, so the things like the box elder bugs, some of the milkweed bugs, those are starting to be active now as things are warming up. So you may see them crawling around and wonder like, man, where did these come from? And they probably came from the leaf litter or, you know, hanging out in the mulch or the brush pile. So don't be alarmed. They're enjoying life. You know, we, we don't really have a ton of pest questions sort of happening right now because we don't have, a, you know, a ton of things that are blooming or, you know, super leafed out yet. But activity is starting to increase, uh, which also means that things like ticks are starting to be more active. If you have a dog and you've gone out, you know, running around here in Pier, you know, Lafram or Farm Island, you will most likely have picked up ticks. So just because it's still a little too early for mosquito season uh, doesn't mean that you can neglect things like your personal repellent. We do have a lot of tick vector diseases from things like the American dog tick. You can still get Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever or Ro Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever or Tularemia. And we also have some new ticks that are sort of moving northward. And one of those is called the Lone Star Tick. And that one can vector the alpha gal protein, which if it bites you and you get that protein, it will make you allergic to red meat. So I really think a lot of people should be a bit more hardcore about protecting themselves against ticks because there are definitely more things out there than just Lyme's disease, which is vectored by the black-legged tick. And that's sort of more on the Eastern one third of the state, if it's sort of you know present at all. We don't have a huge population of that tick, but if you venture into Minnesota or anywhere sort of farther East, you will encounter that tick. So make sure that you are using an EPA approved active ingredient uh, repellent read the label, follow those label directions. And then if you've got pets that are spending time outdoors, make sure that you're talking to your vet and making getting them uh, the proper treatment for a tick and also flea preventative. It is never too early to start worrying about arthropod vector diseases. So that is my spiel. <laughs> well, you know what, uh, Amanda, it sounded great until you said if they tick bites you this is the texan tick i'll call it lone star not, tick lone, lone star, star whatever texas all right um the lone star tick if it bites you you're not gonna eat steak anymore correct it it essentially you get anaphylactic you can have an anaphylactic reaction to red meat so if that wasn't some motivation for folks, especially in the southeast part of the state, because that is where that tick is moving into sort of first, you do want to uh, keep an eye out. 
And if you do happen to have a tick embedded and you remove it, put it in a hard sided container and keep it because you can um, either, you know, through your doctor or through some external labs, you can send that tick in for testing. We do not do any of that uh, at SDSU, but there are other services available and your doctor might be interested um, to make that happen as well. But yeah, so don't just like reflexively flush it if it's been biting you, retain that sample for further investigation and then watch your symptoms. Because a lot of the tick vector diseases, symptoms can line up with things like COVID, the flu, you know, other sort of common illnesses. And so uh, remembering to mention, oh, hey, you know, I got you know, bitten by a tick a week ago or whatever might be relevant to your medical care. So on that note, <laughs> that's, that's depressing. I mean, Lyme's disease, one thing, but to know I'll never eat a cheeseburger again, uh, you know, I, I somehow find, you know, just a real downer. Now, since I spend a lot of time in the Black Hills and you can be covered by ticks by the end of the day, in fact, you can feel them as you're driving across the state overnight. Mm -hmm. Please tell me that Lone Star Tick is not found in Custer. It, not yet. Yet. All right. All right. <laughs> well, all right. That's my personal concern for the day. Um, <laughs> this, yeah, I don't know how we're going to top that for next week. Um, but anyone else have any other closing remarks? We're down to about three minutes here. Uh, I see we're already getting where people can email if they have questions and that. That we do have our our hotlines, and those are always great ways of of getting questions out there. And of course, uh, they'll refer those questions to us if they can't answer themselves. And we're already seeing they're getting lots of good questions out there. So please make use of our. Oh, we're getting a question. Lone Star Tick found near Canton in northwestern Iowa. Is it? I'm going to say probably. I'd have to do the quick look of sort of the CDC map, but yes, it is sort of coming to us from that southern Midwest region, which is why I say that the southeast corner of South Dakota is where uh, we're going to be seeing it and where it has been spotted first. Um, okay. I don't know that we necessarily have a huge population yet, but we have had, re you know, confirmed reports in the state. So. All right. Well, the episode just before Memorial Day. We want a good map. <laughs> is where <laughs> this is at because everybody's going to be out going on a picnic. <laughs> it might be your last summer for steak. Well, well, I'll make a note for tick ranges. We'll, we'll talk right. about those. Uh, we do want to see that. In all seriousness, I know these are these obviously can affect people's health, but uh, that was one that just really kind of caught my attention. Um, <laughs> I don't know how you'd top that, Rhoda or Christine, but did you have anything you wanted to add in our last minute? I think just encouraging people to remain patient. You're going to be out planting those annuals in the garden soon enough. So um, keep them inside and warmer. Keep them at the garden center where they're taking care of them for you for free, kind of. <laughs> Go plant some peas instead. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Peas would be a good alternative. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, that's good. I, I think we'll end on the patience note. That was a good way to start too, Christine. In that, you know, summer, spring will come, probably a lasted day. That's fairly common in our state. And then we'll go into summer. And I'm sure all four of us will be sitting here on a July episode where we haven't seen rain in three weeks and the temperatures haven't been below 80 and two and we'll think back to how nice it was in early may so everyone we're coming up to the end of our hour we certainly hope you enjoyed this first episode for 2022 and uh we hope everyone here will come back next week uh for more updates as to what's going on and probably another tick show too and uh we'll go over what we ought to do in mid-may and i think we have laura edwards on too is going to give us our predictions for the weather coming up in uh 2022 so with that i thank my panelists here rhoda burles christine lane and amanda bachman for helping tonight on the show and uh, this is john ball again and we're closing out for another hour of garden hour so thanks again for watching